Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right, we welcome back again Dr. Jeffrey Morrow for the conclusion of Deconstructing the Bible, the Crisis in Biblical Interpretation. Dr. Morrow, it's a pleasure to have you back. It's a pleasure to be back. So hopefully we'll cover everything that's on the handout. We'll see. Uh, if not, the modernism lecture will, will take over from there, because that's how I hope to end, is how this crisis in biblical interpretation that we've been covering, the history of it, entered the Catholic world. And I think the modernist crisis is the important uh, place where that happens. So I'm not going to uh, review, and the last time I reviewed the session before, I'm not going to review that because we don't have a lot of time and because those, um, those talks are available now on the website, and now there's handouts for each of those. So if you're interested in the prior talks, you, know, you can go to the website and look at that and, uh, and refresh your memory. But where we left off, I believe we were talking about Johann, Doth, and Michaelis. And I'm, I'm going to write these names in here now that Father Hezekiah he, he taught me how to do this. So I'm going to try to see if I can type the names in here. Um, Johann, Doth, and Michaelis. And his student, Johann Gottfried Eichhorn, and their engagement with the work of Jean Ausdruck. Now, Ausdruck is an important figure. He was, the, he was a Jewish surgeon to King Louis XV of France. And uh, just to refresh our, our memories, what he did was he felt inspired to defend the Bible and the tradition of scripture against the criticism that it had received in the prior century, in the 17th century, in the hands of Thomas Hobbes, Baruch Spinoza, and then that, that French guy no one's ever heard of, Isaac La Perere. And so Simone, I'm sorry, Austro wrote this book, The Conjectures of Genesis, about Genesis. But what he did was he isolated what he believed to be many different source documents that Moses would have used. I believe he isolated something like 11 minor sources and then two major sources. And that's, those are the really important ones for our, our discussion, right? He called one, he called source A, and the other, he called source B. Now, in our first webinar, in the question and answer period, somebody asked about the documentary hypothesis. Well, this is part of that early stage. The stage was really set in the 17th century, when these figures like Isaac La Perere and Spinoza and Father Richard Simon and Thomas Hobbes started to challenge the traditional view of who wrote the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And we, and we mentioned before, how one of the, the important points that was understood in the 17th century, both by the defenders of the traditional view as well as the, the newer skeptics, was that if, Mo, if we can question Moses as the author of the Pentateuch or the compiler, well, maybe we can go further and question whether or not God revealed himself at Mount Sinai, whether or not God chose Israel as a people in history. And then, of course, you get out of the Ten Commandments and things like that. Now, most modern scholars can, can debate that and say, well, they're not connected. Those, those two issues are not connected. But in the 17th century, they, they were intimately connected, and that's exactly how this was used. Okay, so Ausdruck sees that, and he comes to the defense of the tradition. So Michaelis, 
Michaelis thought that, that Alstruck had gone too far. One of the other factors here is that Moses served an important role in Michaelis. He wrote a multi-volume work on the laws of Moses that for him, this was like his, this was his magnum opus. This was the most important thing he saw himself doing as a scholar. And he thought that the example of Moses specifically could be used for his contemporary German culture. And so for Ostrup to say, well, Moses is relying upon earlier sources, this was a problem for Michaelis. Although when we think about it, it's really not that, that it shouldn't be that controversial in the sense that obviously Moses wasn't there for the time of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. If he's responsible for the final form of Genesis in some way, or he had to get those stories from somewhere, whether they were oral or written or whatever. But Michaelis took issue with the, the method that Ostrup used, somewhat providentially, because what we start to see is that's exactly what ends up happening throughout history, is they take this method of dividing up the sources based on vocabulary, style. It's all internal evidence, literary evidence, and it, it just uh, snow, snow, snowballs down. And so what we see is this is where this figure of Eichhorn comes into play. Eichhorn was Michaelis' protege. He was the greatest Old Testament scholar of his age. And what he did, at first, he does not challenge the traditional view. So he wrote a very famous textbook. His textbook was used all over the place uh, throughout Germany. And in those initial editions, he accepted mosaic authorship now he, he changes his mind by the end all right by the end of his career he, he doesn't do that anymore but early on he accepted some form of mosaic authorship but what he did was he took me uh Ostrich's work further and he he continued to divide these sources into further documentary sources not just into the beginning of exodus which is where Ostrich stopped because he figured well moses was an eyewitness for the rest of it Therefore, he didn't need to rely upon any other sources. Instead, what, what Eichhorn did was, was, he, was he said, no, 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 to be consistent, if these various criteria, different names for God, right, different ways that God appears through dreams, through an angel, if these tell us that there was probably a different author or source in Genesis, well, what happens when we find those same different vocabulary and style in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They must also tell us that there's different sources being used. And so that was kind of the position that Eichhorn went with. And so that, that actually becomes the foundation, for example, the names for God, right? He's called Yahweh, and then in other places he's called Elohim, right? Now there's, a, there's a very easy response to this, which is one of the reasons that most scholars don't make this distinction anymore. Um, the easy response is that Elohim is the generic name for God. In fact, it's actually plural. It means gods, right? The false gods of the nation. Or in the case of God, right? Elohim is one, one God. And Yahweh is his personal name that he reveals to Moses at the burning bush. So it's sort of like saying the Lord Jesus. Lord is the generic and Jesus is his personal name. But for the scholars of this time period, this, became, this becomes an indicator that there must be different authors involved. Now, I, when I teach this to my students, what I like to tell them is I, I like to, it's an oversimplified example, but I, I like to give the example of, you know, imagine there was a book being written about me, right? And let's say that in the odd chapters, I was referred to as Jeffrey Morrow. In the even chapters, I was referred to as Professor Morrow. And somebody was reading this, and they said, well, you know what? There seems to be two different sources involved. In the odd chapters, right, there's this J source for Jeffrey. And in the even chapters, there's a P source for Professor Morrow. But then, as people are reading the book more carefully, right, because it's so interesting, it's about my life after all, they start to realize that, well, you know, I thought there were these different sources, but now as I read more carefully, some of these chapters have both Professor and Jeffrey Morrow. As opposed to saying, well, maybe 
we were wrong to see those as indicators of different authors, different sources. Maybe, you know, instead what they do is they say, ah, an editor must have come along and taken these different sources and put them together so that it looks like one author. That's over, overly simplified from what actually happens in history with the Pentateuch. But it does give you a sense of, of what happens. Right? I mean, was, all we have to do is think about Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3 as this history of this documentary hypothesis plays out. Genesis chapter 3, we find both Yahweh and Elohim used. Right? Yahweh enters the garden. Right? And yet... The serpent speaks to Eve, the woman, of Elohim, right? And so the argument is, well, even though this is a Yahwistic source using J, the editor put in Elohim in there, and things of that nature. So what we start to see is at the ground level, this starts to build and have a great momentum. There's another thing I want to mention about Eichhorn that's very important, and that is his focus on myth and mythology. He's one of the early figures here who starts to use this category of myth to describe what we're finding in the Old Testament. Now, this is kind of the early stage of Romantic philosophy, and that's going to be very important as we approach the 19th century. And so what some of these biblical scholars did, inspired by Romantic philosophy, is they didn't see myth as necessarily something that wasn't, you know, that was completely false. You know, but this is how we use the, we use the term now. Somebody might say, you know, if you go outside in the cold, you might catch a cold, right? Well, you know, anybody who's studied medicine or, or biology knows that you catch colds from viruses, you catch you get bacterial infections from bacteria, not from temperature, right? And so somebody might say, well, that's a myth. That's not how Eichhorn and others were using the term. What they're doing is they're they're not denying there's truth there. They're denying its historical value as a historical source. So there may be some philosophical truth or some other truth. <coughs> Excuse me. But they're not seeing them as historically, historically valuable. And that's significant. So that starts a whole chain of, of scholars arguing that we need to look at the Bible <coughs> and isolate what's historical from what's mythical. Okay, so that's sort of where we left off in the last time. The next major scholar I want to mention here, I guess we should talk about the, the, what's going on with Jesus. What about Jesus? So New Testament and Old Testament scholarship is all developing at the same time. As I study the history, I'm convinced that the major trends begin with the Old Testament, and then they move to the study of the New Testament and to the study of Jesus and the historical Jesus. Most of the scholars we're covering, not all of them, but the overwhelming majority, are teaching both Old Testament and New Testament. They're publishing in both Old Testament and New Testament. But I'm going to focus on where they were most influential. So Eichhorn is most influential in the Old Testament. The figure I'm going to mention right now, Wilhelm de Vett, and I'm, I'm typing this out for you, although it's also in the handout, Wilhelm De Vett, Wilhelm Martin Lemerecht de Vett, worked in both Old and New Testaments, but he's most significant for the study of the Old Testament. All right? um, he continues the trends of Eichhorn. We're going to come back to him, though, because I want to talk about historical Jesus studies that's happening before de Vett. I want to talk about the figure Samuel Hermann Ramirez. I'm spelling his name wrong. All right? Ramirez lived from 1694 to 1768. Now, when you read his works that were published under his name at the time, he seems very orthodox. He's a very orthodox Protestant theologian. Um, it, would it would have surprised you to realize that his doctoral dissertation was on a figure we covered in either the, the last section of the, I think it was the first webinar, Machiavelli. So Ramirez was a student of Machiavelli. He didn't know him personally, but he studied his works. He wrote his doctoral dissertation on Machiavelli. And so it should not surprise us that he was a religious dissembler of sorts. He was like a Machiavelli's prince, except he didn't have the power of the prince. He was very much like John Toland in this sense as well. 
what Raymaris Ray did is he put on this orthodox face. He wrote works defending traditional views of Christianity. But his private views were something quite different. Right? So his private view, in his private works, he tried to destabilize the text of Scripture. He wanted to deconstruct the Bible. And so he wrote uh, quite a large amount showing why he believed the Old Testament miracles never happened. The New Testament miracles never happened. Jesus probably never rose from the dead, um, etc. We wouldn't even know about this except for Gotthold Lessing. Right, Gotthold Ephraim Lessing. A, a number of historical Jesus scholars would argue that this is really the beginning of the so-called quest for the historical Jesus. Now, if you're not familiar with the various quests of the historical Jesus, that might sound like a good thing, right? And, and there are very beneficial aspects to it. One of my dear friends, Grant Petrie, is a, he does his you know, historical Jesus work. This is important work. But early on, what this meant was it, it, it created a distinction between uh, eventually what was called the, G, the Jesus of history, on the one hand, what really happened, and the Christ of faith, okay? And I would agree with Pope Benedict you know, who saw them as, they're the one of the same, right? The Christ of faith that we see in the Gospels is the most compelling historical account of Jesus, of who Jesus was and what he did. But that is not the view of the figures we're talking about right now, Lessing and Ray Morris. So what Lessing does is he publishes Ray Morris's works that were unpublished, his skeptical works. They're known to history as the Wolf. Wolfenbutel fragments. I can't have, there's no umlaut there, but you can see it on the outline. The Wolfenbutel fragments, because they were published in Wolfenbutel, they're from Wolfenbutel, where, where Morris had been a librarian. And so what Lessing does is he publishes these anonymously, and it causes this huge firestorm of controversy. And people start to write responses. But what also happens is that New Testament scholars start to take some of this material and they build upon it. They don't follow him everywhere. It's too controversial. But they start to build upon it. So as you walk through historical Jesus research, right, with David Friedrich Strauss and others, you start to see resonances with what Ray Morris was doing that, that Lessing made, made public. There's another important figure during this time period that I'm going to mention. It's Ferdinand... Christian Bauer, Ferdinand Christian Bauer. He was born in 1792 and he died in 1860, so he lived well into the 19th century. He's a contemporary of De Vet, right? And what Bauer, Bauer was a church historian at the University of Tübingen in Germany. And he was so influential that he ended up creating a whole school of historical research. There were many, many scholars who followed his work. But the area of church history that he was most influential on was New Testament church history. <clears throat> so have you ever heard of that, that controversy between Peter and Paul? Right, you hear about this, obviously, in the letter to the Galatians. Well, Bauer is the one who argues first that that controversy is an indication that Peter and Paul were completely at odds with each other. In fact, there was an entire church of St. Peter with all of his followers, and an entire church of St. Paul with all of his followers. And they didn't agree. Now, we would see this as a little dispute. There's a little dispute, okay, St. Peter, he's being a hypocrite. He'd already declared, as we see in Acts chapter 15, at the Council of Jerusalem, that we don't need to make distinctions between Jews and Gentiles. You don't need to be circumcised to follow Jesus. And here he is not willing to eat with Gentiles because there's some circumcised followers here. Okay. He gets a fraternal correction, some of public. Case closed. It's done. He, no, he gets it. Paul was basically calling him to account to follow his own divinely inspired teachings. Well, Bauer wants to see this as a much larger, larger thing. And this is, to this very day, this is pretty much the consistent picture we get among contemporary New Testament scholars in the 21st century. This is very common in the university classroom and the scholarship to see these warring factions in the early church. This comes back to Bauer, who was incredibly influenced by the work of John Toland and others, some of the ones we've, we've covered, 
in the last two webinars. Um, so that's what's going on kind of in New Testament scholarship at this time. They're, they're challenging the Jesus of the Gospels. Did he really do that? Well, I'm not so sure. Did he walk in water? You know, who walks in water? That just doesn't happen, right? Uh, why would God suspend the laws that he created? That's just nonsense. And these kind of warring, warring communities in the New Testament, basically reading in Protestant fragmentation from the Protestant Reformation or Revolution into the texts in light of their own 18th and 19th century political disputes that are going on. So Wilhelm de Vett, let me talk a little bit about his importance here. Why is de Vett so important? So that's important because there's a real problem. As Eichhorn's work and the others that follow him, Carl Ilgel and others that we don't need to talk about right now, as they're developing this, this acid, in a sense, to dissolve Scripture into multiple fragments, a problem arises, right? The Samaritan Pentateuch. This is not a new document. Scholars have known about this since prior to Father Richard Simon. Samaritans are still a live community to this day. If you go to Israel, you can, you can see Samaritans. They still exist to this day. The Samaritans have their own Pentateuch. They have their own Torah. And it's, it's very similar to the Torah we all use, the Pentateuch we use. It's written in the Samaritan language, right? So they have a Samaritan dialect of Aramaic, and they have a Samaritan dialect of Hebrew. So they have both forms. They have their liturgical Pentateuch that they would use in their liturgy in Hebrew in the Samaritan script, and they have one that's more common for, for their everyday use in Aramaic, which is their native language, Samaritan Aramaic. There are some differences. So, for example, in the book of Deuteronomy, the central sanctuary where they will worship is Mount Ebal. In the Samaritan Pentateuch, it is Mount Gerizim. Oh, I, mis I misspelled that. Sorry about that. Um, and the reason that it is Gerizim is that that's where their temple is to this day. Right? The, the Samaritans worship on Gerizim. Right? We see this in the Gospel of John when Jesus is speaking with the woman of the well. Right? We worship in this mountain, but you Jews say it's in Jerusalem that we should worship. And Jesus says the hour is coming where it will neither be there nor here, but you will be the, the true worshipers will God will worship God in spirit and in truth. So this is kind of that debate. But other than these, these few passages where the Samaritans have a text that represents their theological views, the entire Pentateuch is the same. Why is that a problem? Because, again, this is not fully formed by Devet's time, but as we get into the 19th century, isn't the Pentateuch written not by Moses, but by the J source, maybe as early as the 10th century, maybe later, and the E source? And isn't the J source a southern text? Right, this is what we this is what we taught in the classroom. Genesis one was written after the Babylonian exile by a priestly source, right? In Jerusalem. Genesis two and following was written by the Yahwistic source, supporting the southern kingdom after north and south split. Right? It's all politics. Well, that's because for these biblical scholars, they are entrenched in political conflict, as we're gonna see in a, in a few minutes here. Um so the problem becomes, why would the Samaritans, descendants of the northerners, after the split between north and south, why would they have southern texts? If the J texts, right, Genesis 2, 3, 4, 5, Genesis 15, if those were written to support the Davidic kingdom after north and south have split, why would the Northerners take these texts which don't support their views, but support the Davidic king? Shouldn't they just have E? I mean, that's really where this comes down to, is if all this is true, if Deuteronomy is a Southern text, right, that's what, the art, that's what, that's what I was taught. Deuteronomy is from the, you know, the South, and it uses, you know, Yahweh, just like the Jehovist, the Yahwist does. Why, if it's a southern text, why does it have Mount Ebal as the central sanctuary? Mount Ebal is in the north. It's by Shechem. It's actually not that far from Mount Gerizim. Anyway, <laughs> they say it's southern. Okay. But if it's southern, why would the northern Samaritans have the whole book of Deuteronomy? And they do. 
there says it's Mount, Mount Gerizim. But they have Deuteronomy. Why would they have the priestly source? Isn't the priestly source coming from the priests who have newly come into power after the Babylonian exile? And they're trying to, you know, this is where circumcision comes from. This is where the Sabbath comes from. The Jubilee tradition. The tithing to the priests. All of these traditions are there. Why? Because you have these priests who are coming to power. They want to rule the people that are now freed from Babylonian exile. How are they going to do it? Through rules that they're going to create and write stories saying, of course you have to give us a tenth of everything. Why? Because God said so way back when. You weren't aware of that? Well, here's the text. That's how this gets used. But that's the question. Why would the Samaritans have all of these texts? They, on this theory, they basically should just have the northern Eloistic texts. They should not have Genesis 17, the account of circumcision. They should have a portion of Genesis 22, maybe not all of it, because the scholars argue that Genesis 22, with the binding of Isaac, is a combination of J and E texts. More detail than you need. But the point is, the Samaritan Pentateuch, Pentateuch, its very existence is a problem for this theory. So what does Devet do? Devet argues he, that there is a long history of cordial relations between the North and the South. He creates this story, this narrative, where North and South were working together, and the Northern priests were getting advice from the Southern priests, and nobody really challenges that. It just kind of brushes away the problem with the Samaritan Pentateuch. All of a sudden, it's no longer a problem. Now we have an explanation for why they would later in the history start adopting the Pentateuch of the South as it is developing, as it is filling out. And then what Devet does is he dates Deuteronomy very late. Once that piece is there, all the pieces are kind of set in, you know, in place for Wellhausen later to come up with a more robust form of what we know of as the documentary hypothesis, right? Again, Devet is also very influenced by Romantic philosophy. He wants to follow that mythic tradition of Eichhorn. The big problem he has is um, rationalism, okay? So you have the work of the philosopher Immanuel Kant. I didn't put this in the handout, but this is some important background to think about. You have the philosopher Immanuel Kant, and Kant's work is overly rationalistic for Devet. It doesn't give him a reason, right, to pray to God. Kant prayed to God. These figures we're talking about believed in God. They prayed. But for Devet, the, the reason was, was too, it was insufficient. He needed something for the heart. And so he found this in romantic philosophy, right, the romantic philosophy of figures like Herder and Scheller. Um, the, in, one important figure for him was this figure, Jakob Fries. Fries was important because he saw Fries as a mediating figure, somewhat like Immanuel Kant, rationalistic, he used reason, but there was also this acceptance of things that did not appear completely reasonable, that moved the passions, the heart, the senses. And that's kind of where Devet went. So he thought there were, there were some very good religious teachings we could learn from the myths, the myths of the Old Testament. But that's a whole other thing than understanding them as historical. And that's kind of where we are in the early to middle part of the 19th century. I want to move to two major, major German figures. All right, Julius Wellhausen and Heinrich Holtzmann. But before I do, I want to give a little context here. I'm not sure if we'll get through this in the first half, and that's okay. We're, we're doing okay. Um, but the context I want to mention is the the Kulturkampf. Kulturkampf, this is a German, fancy German word for Kultur, culture. Kampf, struggle, conflict, war, strife, to culture strife. What this refers to, in the context of history, is basically the 1870s, when Otto von Bismarck was trying to unify Germany. He was the Prussian, Protestant Prussian ruler right, who started to unify Germany. And this became a big issue. Um, an all-encompassing issue. And what the Kulturkampf was, was basically a struggle against the Catholic Church in Germany. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this, because this becomes the context for Holtzmann's work, as well as Wellhausen's work. All right? 
So the 1850s saw this amazing Catholic revival. Uh, I was just using this book recently. We have it on hand. I do. I'm just going to pull this book real quickly here. It's an excellent book. All right, I highly recommend it. It's a doctoral dissertation, but it's very good. It's called The War Against Catholicism. Okay, the war, I have it in the notes, in the outline I mentioned it. The War Against Catholicism, Liberalism and the Anti-Catholic Imagination in 19th Century Germany. It's a doctoral dissertation, but it's very well written. It's not that difficult to read. Uh, might be tedious at, at, at points if you're not into that sort of history, but it's an excellent book. And what he shows is this, this kind of unexamined history of what was going on in the 1850s that led up to the Kulturkampf. Right, so just so you know, Kultur Kampf was crazy. I mean, it's not it's not as bad, not as bad as the Civil War in Spain, not as bad as any you know, it's not as bad as certain things that happened later. But it was crazy. The many of the religious orders, mm. including the Jesuits in Germany, were kicked out. They had to leave. Right, it's, it was in some ways similar to what was going on in the Reformation. Monasteries were liquidated. Those monasteries became state land. The state took the money from them. Uh, there was all sorts of explicitly Catholic legislation coming out, being promulgated and enforced. Now, not all of the monasteries and not all of the religious orders were kicked out because some of them served these kind of um, uh, just essential education functions that this, the state couldn't deal without. But that's it's been an important part of the history. And what a lot of scholars will say is this is an aberration. This is so odd. This is not what you would expect. And what what Michael Gross does in this volume is he shows that this is not, not the case at all. In fact, I'm going to quote from here just for a minute because I have, I have you as a captive audience. And this is worth, worth reading. What he says is, while most accounts of the Kulturkampf give the impression that the anti-Catholic campaign arose spontaneously and suddenly at the beginning of the 1870s and therefore provide little sense of the wide and deep-running anti-Jesuit anti-monastic and anti-Catholic hysteria prior to German unification, the groundwork that made the culture conf possible was in fact prepared over a period of decades. The anti-Jesuit paranoia, rabid anti-monasticism and anti-clericalism and fervent anti-Catholicism that explain the passion of the culture conf developed along with the dramatic revival of popular Catholicism during the 1850s and 1860s. And that was a large quotation from his book. And it's so true. What I think we, we fail to realize is that in the 1850s, these Catholic revivals, not only did they help set Catholics on fire in, the, in, the, in a very positive sense, not, not literally, not like you know, religious burnings at stake, but just set them on fire for God, for their faith, the church, and the sacraments, getting people to confession. But there were loads of Protestants and even Jews who were participating in, in the revivals. It was, it's absolutely amazing that people would leave work and they would go and participate in these very explicitly Catholic revivals. They didn't all become Catholic, but it got them excited about their own faiths, taking their faith seriously. It's kind of an amazing phenomenon. The point I'm trying to make is that the revivals, you couldn't ignore them. And so when the state was trying to unify, it started to see Bismarck and, and the people supporting his culture conf started to see that there's this big obstacle here, and that is the Catholic Church. Why? Because it's got a lot of land. And where are these Carthusians coming from? These Carmelites, these Jesuits? We got some of them from Spain and Italy. Of course, there is no Italy yet, right? Oh, it's becoming Italy. Um, we've got them from all over, not from here. I mean, some of them are Germany, from Germany. The point is they're coming from outside. They're foreigners. And moreover, they support the Pope. I think we mentioned in, a, in an earlier session this, this issue of Episcopal appointment. Who gets to appoint bishops? Well, in Germany, most of the bishops were appointed by the state, right? And uh, the religious orders circumvented all of that. And so they were seen as foreigners 
and as potential threats to the security of the state. That's kind of an important thing to, to keep in mind. Of course, what's the big event that happens in 1870? Of course, your volumes are all muted, so I can't hear any of you. But I know you all know the first Vatican Council, right? The first Vatican Council closes in 1870, closes early, because Pius IX and the Papal States, the Vatican is being protected by these French troops. They're invaded by the Piedmontese under Gregory the Sixteenth, right prior to Pius the Ninth. This is a real problem. What do we do? Um, and so, help the Pope. And so, people come to support the Pope, especially the French. And so, the French troops are basically the only thing between Pius the Ninth, the Pope at the time, and the invading, the, you know, the hopefully invading troops. They're going to take over the Vatican. What happens in 1870? The Franco-Prussian War breaks out between the French and the, the Prussians. And so the French troops have to leave the protecting the Vatican, and they go and they help fight the Prussians, right? Bismarck <laughs> and others. And, uh, and the Piedmontese come in, and, and the Pope becomes a prisoner of the Vatican. Vatican I ends, and no more papal states. There's no more ever again... To this day, papal states. Right? So we get Vatican City with the Concordat with Mussolini later. That's in the 20th century. But all this politics is important because it gives you a sense of what's going on behind the scenes. The broader Prussian, Protestant political context in which Valhausen and Holtzman are working is one that is anti Catholic, anti Jesuit, right? anti uh, ritual anti-sacrament, anti-priesthood, all of that is there. And that's all important to keep in the back of our heads as we're walking through this history. All right? So that's all going on behind the scenes. Now I want to mention a couple things taking us back to the 18th century with Michaelis and Göttingen and tying us in here is that ever since the foundation of the University of Göttingen, and these Enlightenment universities, some of them are reconstituted. In the case of Göttingen, it is formed for the first time. They're trying to, to create good civil servants for the state, initially King George, but eventually just the German state. And what happens is all of the faculty, the professors, are civil servants. They're all functionaries of the state. And we, we think about this, and it's hard really to get our minds around this. But they, they work in many ways behind the scenes. The example I gave on the, on the outline is the later figure, Adolf von Harnack, right, who lived into the, into the 20th century. And, and Harnack was the figure who drafted the letter defending Germany's entrance into World War I. And this was a normal thing. This is what professors did. They were the ones, so, so the Kaiser would write, you know, send a letter with his name. And it was really written by you know, a church history professor. And so this is important to keep in mind. These are people who have a very vested political interest in what they're doing. And they're very attuned to these things. All right, so case in point, Valhausen and Holtzmann. Maybe I should start with Holtzmann. I'll start with Holtzmann, even though in the outline I start with Valhausen. Holtzmann, Holtzmann is important for what becomes known as the two-source hypothesis for the gospel composition, as I mentioned in the, in the outline, right, there's this thing called the synoptic problem, right? It refers to the synoptic gospels, right? The synoptic gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke, right? Sin in Greek together. Well, I misspelled that. Sorry about that. Oh, I'm still getting used to this high you know, te technology stuff. So sin, I write with a pen and paper. Sin together. Right, optic from the word for eyes, so you see it together. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke, as you read through these, you start to see that, gosh, their, their chronologies are very similar. They have a lot of the same stories. There's differences, a lot of differences. But they seem a lot more similar than, say, the Gospel of John, even though there's similarities there, too. And so what has always been known, I mean, this is already the origin, St. Augustine, the early centuries of Christianity, is that a lot of Mark, for example, is in Matthew and Luke. They share a lot of these texts, you know, words, phrases, stories in common. So how do we account for that? That's what's known as the synoptic problem. How do we account for that? So this figure, Jakob Griesbach, 
comes along in the 1700s, I'm sorry, in the 1800s. Actually, no, no, he's a contemporary of Michaelis. Date's not in front of me, it's not in my head, but it's on the outline. So Griesbach comes along, he's a contemporary of Michaelis, a little bit after, I think, as well. And he argues, I believe in the 1700s, he argues that Matthew was first, right, the first gospel written, that is the consistent universal tradition of the church from earliest times until the 1860s, <laughs> basically. Um, and what Griesbach argues then is that what happens is this. He's going to tweak St. Augustine's view. And what he tweaks it is he says that Matthew was first, and then Luke used Matthew when he was writing his account. Which isn't that, doesn't stretch, you know, doesn't strain credibility too much. Luke says he uses other sources. And then what Griesbach does is he argues that Mark also used Matthew and Luke. And the tradition, of course, that we have from Papias in the 200s, which is preserved for us in Eusebius' Ecclesiastical History in the, four, in the 300s, 4th century, is that Mark is summarizing Peter's preaching in Rome. So he's using a gospel that basically represents St. Peter's preaching, the first pope. Now, I'm not going to get into, you know, the newer theories and you know, what's going on, what actually happened. But what Griesbach wants to argue is, is Mark is using Matthew and Luke. So Holtzmann enters this history in the 1860s, right? Holtzmann was born in 1832, died in 1910. I believe it was 1863. It's on the outline. He argues in print that no, 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 no. Matthew's not first. Mark is first. There's a lot of reasons for this. It's the shortest, it's the simplest, blah, blah, blah. So he argues that Mark is the first gospel and that Matthew and Luke both use Mark. Now, nobody basically followed them. There were a lot of refutations. People were fairly persuaded by the refutations of Holtzmann. Okay? But then enter 1870. And then 1872. And we go forward in time. All of a sudden, in the 1870s, during the culture count, and into the 1880s, Holtzmann's view begins to gain traction, it begins to gain a following in the German-speaking world. And then in the early 20th century, it takes off. If you are hard-pressed, I tell you right now, you are hard-pressed to find in the English and German-speaking world scholars who argue that Matthew was first. They exist. I know a lot of them, <laughs> you know, the few, my friends, myself. But we are few and far between. The majority of scholars now in the English and German-speaking world and it doesn't matter if they're evangelical Protestant, if they're more liberal Protestant, Catholic, whatever. I've heard homilies at Catholic masses. I've heard homilies going on and on about Mark and priority and the two and Q, right? The Q source, which accounts for passages that are similar in Matthew and Luke, but nowhere else. Um, so this is this becomes widespread. Why did it become widespread, and why after Vatican I? So not just the 1870; it's Vatican I. Well, because Vatican I defined solemnly the authority of the Pope, papal infallibility, the right, the right, which none of you will find as radical, but it was radical, the, the absolute right of the Pope to, to be able to communicate directly with his bishops, regardless of where they were. Why is that so radical? Because states were arguing that the Pope did not have that right. He had absolutely no right to communicate directly with their appointed bishops, unless they say so. So Vatican I says absolutely not. Pope has the right to communicate directly with his people. So when it came to papal authority, where did the church go? Where did it go? Matthew chapter 16. You do a whole webinar just on that, right? Matthew chapter 16, right? Jesus says, you are Peter. And upon this Peter, this Petra, this rock, I will build my church, right? You are in the Aramaic, it would be Kepha. You are Kepha, upon this Kepha, right? In the Greek, he is Petros, the masculine form of Petra. And the reason for using Petra, that feminine form, sorry for the tangents, is because that's what the Dome of the Rock was called. The Rock, I'm sorry, the Rock, the Evan Shetiah, the Rock that the Temple was built upon was the Petra, right? So that in Matthew 7, when we hear Jesus talk about the wise and foolish builders, the wise man builds his house on the Petra, 
So he's making a link between Peter and the rock of the temple, so the new church. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. What you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. What you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Okay? Luke chapter 22, where Jesus says, Simon, Simon, Satan has determined to sift you like wheat. Many English translations obscure the Greek here. Actually, it's better if you look at some of the foreign translations. But the Greek actually says, Simon, Simon, Satan has determined to sift you. It's plural you, all of you, y'all, like wheat. But I have prayed for you, singular, Simon Peter, that when you come back, when you return, strengthen your brothers. He's singling Simon Peter out there. John 21, Simon, son of John, you love me more than these, right? Domine tu omnia nosti tu shisquil amote. Lord, you know all things, you know that I love you. What does Jesus say to him? Feed my sheep. Tend my lambs, feed my flock. Well, who does that? The shepherd. Well, who's the good shepherd? Jesus. Just as God is the good shepherd of the, of, in the old. Jesus, in John's gospel, is the good shepherd. He is God. And he is entrusting that shepherding ministry to St. Peter and thus his successors. Those are what are cited in Pastor Eternus in Vatican I. Not Mark. You could cite Mark. There's a lot of Petrine stuff in Mark. But it doesn't. And so what starts to develop is this argument in the Prussian state of Germany that Mark is the earliest gospel, right? Mark doesn't have all those Catholic embellishments from the early Catholic Church of Matthew 16, Luke 22, John 21. It doesn't have any of that. That was all added in later in these debates between the Petrine Church and these other churches. You know, the earliest gospel is Mark. Therefore, there's no supremacy of Peter or the Pope. So this became enforced in the German universities. If you want, if you wanted to get promoted, if you wanted to get tenure, you know, if you wanted to get a job, you basically had to hold a mark and priority. This becomes really important, actually. Now, I don't, I don't mention this in the outline, but there's a fantastic book on the history of the discipline of history in the United States by a man named Peter Novick called That Noble Dream, right? the quest of objectivity in the history of disciplines. And one of the things he shows is how in all these disciplines of history, and it worked for biblical studies as well, these scholars, English-speaking scholars, particularly in the United States, were being trained in Germany by these German historians. And so this stuff spread like wildfire. There's another figure involved, which we'll, we'll mention after the break, in disseminating this stuff among the English-speaking world. Suffice it to say, this became the, the mainstream view in, um, in the German academy and what was going on in Germany. We can say a lot about that, but what, instead I want to turn our focus to Julius Wellhausen. I know I only have a few minutes before the break, but I'm going, to, I'm going to take those minutes. So Wellhausen is a very important figure here. He also wrote on the New Testament. He also followed Holtzmann in the mark and, in mark and priority. But I don't want to focus on that. Nobody knows about him for that. Um, they know about him because of the documentary hypothesis. He gave it its most clear expression. The main textbook version is still circulated today in textbooks around the world, even though you're not going to find scholars who adhere to this classic formulation anymore. They don't exist really anymore. Um, they, you know, they'll tweak it. You know, there is, maybe there's no J. There's just the E, D, and P. Maybe there's no E, it's just J, D, and P, and P we split into P and H. And of course there's levels, there's E1, E2, E3, J1, J2, J3, etc. It's really complicated, really fast. And now they're moving into a fragmentary hypothesis, which is closer to what DeVette was arguing, more or less, where there's no documentary sources, just little bits and patches and little stamp-sized fragments, millions of them all over the place that just kind of get sewn together by varying layers of editors. Well, Fell has this key here. Fellhausen was a staunch Bismarck supporter. And he, he hated the Torah, the Pentateuch. He loved the prophets. Surprise, liberal Protestant in Germany. Loved the prophets. Down with ritual, boo, tradition. Right? But he had never read the, the, the Torah until much later in life. So he's writing this, this prolegomena, prolegomena sur Geschichte Israel, right? The prolegomena of the history of Israel which was a revision of his earlier Geschichte Israels, the history of Israel, which I mentioned in the outline. 
And he kind of gives us a little bit, he lifts the veil a little bit, tells us what's really going on. And what he says is, you know, he felt bad, he felt guilty that he had not read the Pentateuch. Aren't the prophets based in the Pentateuch? And so what he does is he reads the Pentateuch and he hates it. Ritual, sacrifice, blah, 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 this is horrible. This is, this is bad. What am I supposed to do? He's depressed. I can't even read the prophets anymore. What am I supposed to do? And then he says that he finds out that Carl Heinrich, Carl Heinrich Graf, he heard, dated the Pentateuch to after the time of the prophets. And this is what he says. He says, almost without knowing the reasons, I accepted that this is probably true. Right. That's not quite a word-for-word quote, but pretty darn close. It's pretty close. You can find it, page four of this prolegomena, both in English and in German. It's amazing. And um, we'll leave it at that. Let's stop here for that. This is a good stopping point. He builds his theory right, based on that starting point. So we'll stop there for now, and we'll continue after the break. So we left off with Wellhausen. And by the way, so this is the book, um, the book that Scott Hahn and I are working on right now is taking all this history basically from Michaelis, in the, the, through Wellhausen. So this is, I'm working on this actively right now. So um, when it comes out, you have to read the book. That'll give you much more detail, be much better. Um, Wellhausen's very, very important. He's really, I mean, he really was revered and still is in many ways as the most important Old Testament scholar from the 1870s to the 19, until he died in 1918. Um, I mean, he's made an honorary member of all these American associations, really a giant, leading giant. He helped out with um, Paul Haupt's uh, Polychrome Bible, where they, they went through the sources, they color-coded them. Uh, Haupt was a German scholar who ended up being a professor at the University of Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. It's not that important right now. But the point of that Valhausen is very important. He became incredibly influential all over the world. Even those who couldn't read German right, were influenced by his work, as we'll see in a minute. So Valhausen starts to argue this. What he does is he builds upon the work of others. A lot of names, you don't really need to know them right now, but um, Graf is an important one. Even his own teacher, Heinrich Ewald, they had a falling out politically. Um, there are, are many of these figures that they really, that became uh, important. So he's really building on the work of all of them, but he's synthesizing. He's a great synthesizer of these theories. And so he comes up with this cogent view, right? So he says that, you know, the priests are influenced by, they're interested in um, ritual sacrifice, stuff like that. The um, cleanliness laws, right? In the Yahwistic accounts, God appears like a man walking in the garden. In the Aloistic accounts, he appears either through an angel or, or mediated in a dream, etc. It's very kind of clear, clear cut. And he has a fairly intricate editorial layer scheme here that's not usually taught in introductory textbooks. I'm not going to get into that. It's not that important right now. But he does have, it's, he's a little bit more nuanced. He's aware, he's aware of some of the problems, actually, in his theory. And he's pretty much aware of that. The other thing I would say is, as Danny was mentioning before, you know, he didn't have a lot of biblical scholarship behind it. It had a lot of biblical scholarship behind it. But what Valhausen did not do, and he could have done, in the sense that he had the skill set, and he was criticized even by his friends at the time, was he didn't really use any comparable ancient Near Eastern material. I just read an article that says that in his private views near the end of his life, he said, okay, maybe we should. <laughs> but he never did anything with that. And in fact, early on, he explicitly argues against that. Well, now what I mean by that is this, is that the 19th century, and especially the 20th century, but the 19th century was really the age of archaeology. It really was beginning to boom. And it was a new discipline, and material remains, cuneiform tablets and such, were just popping out of the ground, left and right. And that continued well into the 20th century. It's still happening today. And he could read cuneiform, right? So Valhausen knew Akkadian. At one point, the, the scholars who studied that are called the Syriologists. He actually considered becoming an Assyriologist at one point in his career. But he didn't do it. I think he had like three minor publications on Assyriology. Uh, Peter Machinus at Harvard University did an article a few years ago, a very likely one, called The Path Not Taken. And it's on Valhausen and Assyriology where he deals with this. 
So Fellhausen argued that you basically, you just, you want to understand the Old Testament, just look at the Old Testament. You don't need to go elsewhere to understand the cultural background and things of that nature. So his view was completely internal. But this is one of those great ironies I, I bring up with my students when we're talking about historical criticism, because the method is called historical criticism. And so I'll, I'll ask you as I ask them, though you're not going to answer me. When you think of historical disciplines, where do you go? What is, what's historical? Right? And the responses are usually pretty good. You look to other ancient documents, archaeological artifacts, clay pots, you know, digging in the, in the, in the field, etc. That's, that's pretty good. That is not what historical criticism does. Now, when I say that, I'm using kind of the textbook, narrow definition of historical criticism, which now is divided into three forms, source, form, and redaction. In Bellhouse's day, it was basically source, and form was just getting off the ground. Okay? And the idea of source criticism looks at hypothetical documents, literary documents behind a text. We don't know if they ever really existed, right? The clues to them is not that we found the document. Rather, it's, oh, I'm reading this chapter, and there's different phrases I'm finding from the earlier chapter, and I'm seeing different names pop up, things like that. Or, didn't we just hear about this, right? They said, God said, build the Ark of the Covenant this way. And then we hear a description of what he said, build it like this, and like that, with gold over here, right? And then over here we read, and then they built it. Like this and like that with gold over here. Now we would say, well, that's the announcement and the fulfillment, right? We're having a description of what God is commanding, and then we're having a description of how they're fulfilling God's command. But these source critics said, no, 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 who would do that? That's silly. These must be two different sources. And they, and they just walk through the texts like that. Form criticism looks at oral traditions, hypothetical oral traditions behind the texts, like parables. Where do the parables come from? Things of that nature. And then redaction criticism looks at the editorial process, all of which is hypothetical, none of which we know for sure. Right? The only thing we know for sure is the document we have before us and any of the documents that we find. So that's historical criticism in a nutshell. So Fellhausen did this. It was incredibly influential overnight. People started following his view all over the world. Now, how did this get into the English-speaking world? Well, through a figure I mentioned named William Robertson Smith. A lot of people neglect him. He's not actually that important as a biblical scholar. He did do work in biblical scholarship. He did do a lot of work. Uh, he was really pioneering in the early discipline of, of anthropology. Of course, his focus was in Arabia, right, because that's what he thought would be an important you know, uh, way of studying the Old Testament. I mean, this goes back to Johann Dr. Michaelis. Right? Michaelis actually helped come up with this expedition in Arabia. Why? Because we figured, you know, if we want to understand what the Bible was like, the Old Testament, we have living examples, right? Arab, nomadic Arabs in Arabia. Why don't we go study them? Then we'll learn about this biblical context. And their language of Arabic is probably even closer to Old Testament Hebrew than Hebrew that you might hear Jews reading and speaking. I mean, a little tongue-in-cheek, but then it's pretty close actually to what they were arguing. So, so with William Robertson Smith, likewise. So he wanted to study the nomadic peoples, the Semites. Right? He has this book, Religion of the Semites. He did a lot of other books like that, too. So he studied Arabia. It's actually, his work is very important for early Semitic covenants and other things. He gets the family relationship and other things. So Smith becomes really important because this is, in a, in a sense, where our, our discussion comes full circle. Right? Think about it. Martin Luther in Germany, Protestant Reformation, arguing for dividing up the text. Some of these texts are less authentic than others or less inspired than others, etc. Paul didn't write Hebrews. Hebrews probably doesn't belong in the Bible. Things like that. Luther did that. He said, hey, all right, he changed his mind with Hebrews, maybe. Um, but that's important to kind of keep in mind. John Wycliffe in in England, putting the, you know, the seedbeds of what becomes deistic biblical interpretation. And then what happens? The deists, like John Toland and others in England, really run with this. 
and they're just soaking up. They were inspired, they think, by the Protestant reformers, and they're taking it a step further. They're seen as this progress, and they're soaking up the religious skepticism of Scripture of the 17th century. Hobbes, but especially Spinoza and Father Richard Simon. And then what happens? We, we, right? we mentioned this in the last session. To the work of Johann Zemmler and Johann Michaelis, especially those two, all of this deistic English language biblical scholarship comes into the German world through their translations and their work. Zemmler actually translated some of this deistic work. He did it for his, his teacher, Baumgarten, and others. And, um, and Michaelis translated Robert Loth's work. So they're bringing English scholarship into the German-speaking world, and it takes off. And I think one of the big reasons that it takes off is because of the institutional support they get at the universities, at the state-sponsored universities. And so now, they don't have to worry about an individual patron. They have the whole state-run university system that gets the money from taxation. So it becomes this huge perpetuating thing. They don't have to worry about about funding. They don't have to ask for money. They're not like the Institute of Catholic Culture or some Catholic organization that can ask for money or mendicant order or whatever. It's coming in from taxpayer money. It's there, right? So, I mean, that's something important to keep in mind. It's always there. They're not hungry. They're not, they don't have to go looking for it. It's there. And so that helps perpetuate and fund these projects. And some of these projects, I mean, they're expensive, these expeditions to Arabia, and they can't even rely upon state funding. They have to get uh, a wealthy nobleman involved and a, and a prince to help back it. But they're getting all kinds of wild, expensive um, expeditions going on. It's very important. And so Germany takes that English criticism and just builds upon it. And now what's happening? Now, William Robertson Smith travels to Germany. He becomes a close personal friend of Julius Wellhausen. They write letters together later on. Um, they correspond. And he agrees with Wellhausen, so he, he actually likes his work. He starts to be introduced to a number of other German biblical scholars and theologians, and they become friends. Now, why is this important? Because you may never, you may never have heard of really William Robertson Smith before, right? If you've read Alistair McIntyre's After Virtue, right? I'm not sure if he's in there, but he is in, in Three Rival Versions of Moral Enquiry, right? Alistair McIntyre's third book, which many of you probably have never read. Maybe Danny's read it. Um, it's important, though, why? Because if you haven't heard of Smith, I guarantee that almost everybody watching me has heard of one project he was intimately involved with. You may even have one of the recent collections in your home. That's the Encyclopedia Britannica, right? The most famous edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica in the history of the world was the ninth edition, because the ninth edition included scholars from all over. I mean, huge, giant scholars, the top scholars from everywhere. William Robertson Smith began as the co-editor and then became the sole editor of the ninth edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica. And you guessed it. He included Julius Wellhausen and a number of these German scholars in that volume. He had their works translated into English. So when it came to the history of Israel, Wellhausen got to include his theory of the history of Israel in an essay, a very popular essay. In fact, now, if you get, if you purchase, you can go online, you know, it's for free, you can get it online for free. Um, if you want to read Julius Wellhausen's prolegomena of the history of Israel in English, it's available to you for free online, or you can buy an expensive copy. And it has his Encyclopedia Britannica article on Israel attached to it. And at least the edition I have is a foreword by William Robertson Smith. So I mean, so this is very important. So Smith, he also gets some of these scholars like Bellhausen to write for English encyclopedias and other dictionaries beyond the Encyclopedia Britannica. So this Scotsman, William Robertson Smith, becomes one of the most important, not the only, but one of the most important sources for bringing German biblical scholarship not just to the English-speaking world, because these scholars are publishing in journals that English scholars are reading, people are reading, right, at Princeton Theological Seminary. This is the heart of, you know, the origin of the fundamentalist movement, self-identified fundamentalists at the dawn of the 20th century. They're reading Gellhausen in the original German. 
But for the Encyclopedia Britannica, now they're bringing Wellhausen into people's homes. Right? Hey, Dan, I got a question about Israel, this Old Testament thing. Let's look it up in the Encyclopedia, son. And now you get Wellhausen's view articulated in his own words in your language. Does that make sense? Really important. I think that's that's why that's where I think if if um, at this point in the drafting process in the Han and, and, and Morrow book, we were including this section here. I think it's important. It may not stay there in the end. We'll have to talk about that. But but this I think it's really important, and you'll see how this plays out. All right. So we need to transition though with the time that remains. I want to transition now. We do have time. How this gets into the Catholic world. And I'm not going to steer. I promise. It, it's not likely that I will steal the thunder of your next speaker, because I'm focusing on the biblical scholarship here of one figure in the modernist controversy. I'm not going to give the whole history of the, of the controversy. I'm going to focus on this figure, Alfred Loazi. I'll spell it, even though you have it on your phone, I'll spell it. Alfred Loazi. Very important figure. All right. Loazi was born in 1857. 1857. All right. It's two years before Charles Darwin publishes The Origin of Species in 1859. But he doesn't die until 1940. So it's a pretty, pretty good-sized life, a good long life. So he dies in 1940. So he lived a long time. He published an incredible amount. I mean, it's overwhelming. I work in Loazi scholarship. I've got a book coming out on Loazi from the Catholic University of America Press. And I, can just, I haven't read everything that he's written. He's just written too much. He published something like 60 books. I mean, that's amazing, right? Um, articles, even more articles. He was prolific. He wrote a grammar of the Akkadian language that I'm not sure if it exists anymore. It was never published. And I don't know anybody that's ever seen it. But he did. He wrote one. I mean, that's, that's how I'm, this guy was prolific. So Loazi, I see as a real tragic figure. A lot of people describe him more like a demon and then in the circles that I run in, in, in the academic scholarly circles of Catholics in the United States, not to scandalize you, but he's seen as like a saint, right? So in a lot of the circles I, I travel in, right, Pope Saint Pius X is seen as like the devil incarnate, the Antichrist, and Loazi is seen as the saint. And there's a reason for that. And I, uh, you know, I, I can't get into all the details here. And it's, uh, it's sad, but I think if you study the history, this is live, so I gotta, <laughs> but it's going to be staged. I have to be careful what I say. If you study the history leading into the 1960s and the 1970s into today, I think you're going to find a very similar history in the 60s and 70s of what was going on in the modernist controversy. They're related. It's not an accident. Uh, I'm a member of this La Société Internationale de Etudes of Alpha Loisie. Right, should I write that? It's not important. It's the International Society of the Slave, Alfred Loazi. I'm, I'm the youngest guy there. I'm not even 40 years old yet. Okay? The next youngest person that's a major player in that society that does a lot of work, you know, who I work with, is getting close to 70. It's a huge time gap. My own doctoral advisor is over 70. But he's a, a, a major figure in that group as well. The person who, um, you know, the point is that it's a big age gap of the people who are actively involved. There's other members, but actively involved every year at the sessions. And what I notice is these scholars came of age in the 60s and 70s. A lot of them are seminarians. Some of them are still priests in good standing. Some of them were priests. Not the ones I'm talking about. But, but anyway, the point is that they came of age in the late 60s and early 70s. And that time period, if you listen to their stories, they describe what they experienced very much like how the modernists describe their stories. A lot of confusion, you know, issues with formation, or a lot of issues on a whole lot of levels. Again, I wish we had eyes to see what's going on behind the scenes at the supernatural level. We don't. But, but they're, it's tragic. And I look back to the modernists, I see it's really a tragic time period. Very tragic. So Loazi, when I study this stuff, brings me some sadness, you know, and I pray for him and repose of his soul, because we want, you know, um, don't have a lot of hope. He died outside of the church, right? And uh, a, val and a valid skeptic. 
Unlike George Tyrrell, his compatriot, Jesuit, was also excommunicated. They were excommunicated the same year, 1908. Tyrrell, at the end of his life, went to confession. They couldn't understand what he said, so they gave him conditional absolution. And then he was given, as he was going out, he was given another conditional absolution. But he was not given a church burial because of the nature of their condemnation required an explicit repudiation of the positions they held. So juridically, it was a it was a tricky issue. So we don't know we don't know anything about where these people are. But they didn't. Have, it wasn't it's a very tragic, not a positive time period. And so you have to keep that in mind. You're seeing a lot of hypocrisy among the clergy. There's formation issues. They're engaging with new ideas, and they're finding some of them attractive. And they're being told, "Well, don't you know? Don't do that." And they're not being given tools to deal with what they're dealing with. So we're going to talk about a little bit of this. So Loazi was a Catholic priest, ordained, and he studied with biblical scholars. Uh, one of the major figures he worked with was Ernest, Ernest Renan. Renan is an important French skeptic, ex-Catholic. Um, he was a major skeptic. He was a major figure bringing Wellhausen and the work of German biblical scholars to the French-speaking world when it's run on. So Loazi received permission from his spiritual director to audit, to sit in Renan's classes. Uh, in hindsight, who knows if that was a <laughs> maybe not the best idea. Um, he was working with this guy Vigarou, Fulcron Gregoire Vigarou, very important biblical scholar. I can say that publicly. You know, people, I can defend that people don't like that. A lot of modern scholars think Vigarou is a, a nutcase, you know, a simplistic, simple-minded Catholic apologist, a pretty impressive apologist. Great command of languages, scripture, ancient, ancient texts, science. He wrote on biology. He wrote on all sorts of things. But he didn't hold views that people now consider, um, you know, he, he had trouble with, um, certain forms of evolutionary theory as it was just getting on the ground. He had, you know, he thought Moses wrote the Pentateuch. There were all these things that are kind of forbidden in modern ac the academy. He held that he defended traditions of the church, uh, and he did a lot of apologetics. Well, Loazi had problems with some of the ways he did apologetics in the classroom. He didn't find them all very persuasive. Combine that with Loazi studying with Renan, where he's getting to hear German historical criticism, the stuff we've been talking about firsthand from somebody who uses it well and knows it very well. But one area he saw missing in Renan's work that he could have criticized Bellhausen for, too, was, was a lack of engagement with the material coming out of the ancient Near East, the Assyriological material, the, the remains of ancient Assyria and Babylon in their own language, Babylonian and Assyrian. So what did Loazi do? He went and he studied those languages and wrote a dissertation on the topic on the royal annals of Sargon II, and he learned, he learned ancient Egyptian, he learned Akkadian, really mastered the Akkadian language. He wrote a lot on that topic for a while. He became a professor of scripture at the Institut Catholique in Paris. Uh, and this is where he gets in trouble. He gets in trouble because he's using Bellhausen's views. He holds to a, a limited, limited form of inerrancy, limited inspiration. And he gets told by the secretary, Cardinal Rompala of uh, Pope Leo XIII, to stop working in, in biblical studies. And actually, we have an account. Loazi wrote a lot about himself. So he wrote a short autobiography, shows passé, right? He wrote a, a much larger three-volume autobiography of his memoirs, very involved. Uh, he, wrote other, he wrote several autobiographies that he published in his lifetime. You know, it's... We could say a lot about that, but I don't want to psychoanalyze it. Um, and in these, he mentions at one point, since Cardinal Rompalo was just expressing the Pope's personal opinions, I decided to ignore it. <laughs> it's really not the kind of thing you do. And, you know, he really, he really narrates this as trying to avoid being excommunicated, laying low, and then once he gets excommunicated, he narrates that as a breath of fresh air, as a moment of liberation. So it's, it's tricky to figure out what was he thinking early on. So he's writing this stuff, he gets in trouble. Then in 1893, Pope Leo XIII publishes Providentissimus Deus, the first papal biblical encyclical 
ever. And his main targets are Maurice Dulst, who I don't think I mentioned, right, the rector of the seminary in Institut Catholique, where um, Loazi was teaching, and Loazi. So those are the two f- figures that were really at the heart of Leo's work. It was the main figures involved. Doesn't He didn't name them. It wasn't a tradition. It was a tradition in papal documents not to name the people by name that you're dealing with. Um, you want to deal with them privately, personally. You, you have concern for their souls, that sort of thing. And you recognize that there are broader movements out there. There are more people being influenced by what you're doing. So Leo sets up the Pontifical Biblical Institute to deal with this. The Pontifical Biblical Commission gets set, set up. And the Pontifical Biblical Commission starts with, with Loazi's former teacher, Vigaru, at its head as secretary. It starts to address some of these issues, like the Mosaic authorship of the Pentateuch, which it defends in 1906. Right? And then so St. Pius X becomes Pope in 1903. Great catechist, and a concern. He's the one who lowers the age of, of Eucharist, of reception. Great concern for the faithful. He's been getting wind of all of these movements going on at Catholic seminaries, by Catholic priests like Loazi and others. And he's very concerned for the harm this can do, right, for the faith, for the people. So in 1907, he publishes Providentissimus Deus, right? It's, this is his, um, sorry, Ascendi Dominici Regis, Providentissimus Deus. I'm getting confused. It's late at night. That's my bedtime. Uh, Pascendi Dominici Gregis, condemning modernism. Already prior to this, so this comes out in September, already prior to this, I believe it's in July, I think it's on the outline, the Holy Office of the Inquisition, signed by St. Pius X, comes out with Lamentabili Sani Exitu. I'm typing this out, Sani Exitu. Same year, a few months earlier, which condemns Propositions of the modernists. This is very interesting. Now the archival work has been done and it's been published, and they prove, they really prove that this has come out of, some of it at least, Loazi's works. It's not only that lines are quoted from his works, but through the archival work they can see which documents they're taking it from. So they're actually taking some propositions from Loazi's published works and then condemning them. That's interesting. So he really is one of these major figures involved here behind the scenes. Uh, and then Pachetti Domenici Gregis comes out. And in that encyclical, Pius X, St. Pius X condemns modernism as the synthesis of all heresies. And it's a tricky document because you go through this, you know, it says, you know, if you hold one of these, you're guilty of holding them all. I mean, you might say, oh, I might be guilty of holding some of them. One, is, one that I always come back to is if you enjoy or if you like novelty in archaeology, well, define novelty in archaeology. I mean, I kind of like novelty in archaeology. So some of this comes down to how is this being defined? It gets a little tricky. And so these figures are trying to figure, you know, is this, uh, he's talking about me? Is he talking about me? Is he talking about you? Who's he talking about? And Loaz, they kind of know he's talking about him. He knows that. Tyrrell, they know that. They're already getting in trouble with their bishop. Tyrrell's in trouble with the Jesuits. They're already getting in trouble. The following year, they get excommunicated. So Loazi is solemnly excommunicated. He actually finds out in the news prior to actually getting his, uh, receiving his, his document. Um, an interesting thing. And then he becomes the chair of the history of religion at the Collège de France. And that's where he retires from. And then he dies in 1940. He publishes a, a tremendous amount. And he goes off the deep end. I mean, he goes, he starts to explain the origin of Christianity and Jesus and the resurrection based on the cult of Mithras. And he's influenced by this Belgian scholar, Franz Cumont. And all this stuff kind of happens. It's important to keep in mind, though, because I think what this is what I would argue. I would argue that this time period is incredibly important for understanding the crisis of modern biblical interpretation in the Catholic world. Two major reasons. Right? One, it becomes the main entrance of this work into the Catholic world. I mean, these guys are taking, you know, Friedrich Baron von Hugel, Loazi, all these figures are taking Wellhaus and especially, and these others, and bringing them in, right? Loazi, Mark and Priority. Again, it's not that these individual issues are the death knell of the Catholic faith. They're not. They're not. 
but they get used in all these ways. And the, way, the, the doubt that gets placed on the tradition, we might say, is too quick. Okay, it's too quick. And they're not submitting to authority, et cetera. The same old story. But they're all doing this. So these seminary textbooks have become very popular. Um, they're being used all over the all over the United States of America, France, in, you know, all over Germany. So that's the number one. Is this becomes amazingly influential in the Catholic world, forming Catholic priests, and then it goes underground. It doesn't really disappear. There's a very important book called uh, I think it's American Catholic Biblical Scholarship by Gerald Fogarty, great historian, great history, great book. I don't agree with all of his conclusions and, and the ways in which he narrates the history, but if you just read the data, and if you read the end notes, it's very telling. You get to hear about the archival work showing evidence that what some of these professors were teaching was one thing, and then with select students, and behind the scenes when they wouldn't get in trouble, they were teaching what was forbidden. And that's interesting. So that's always there under the ground. I don't think that ever dies away. And it starts to creep up little by little. You start to see scholars pushing the envelope in the 50s and in the 60s. And then it kind of reaches ahead and more controversies break out. And then, and then they see themselves, they re-narrate the history so that they see themselves as being able to do this work. That's a whole other topic for another time. The second thing that happens is actually the response against the modernists. It becomes overly harsh. And it's not all done by the magisterium. You have this group that, that gets started, this sodality of pious. It's just a kind of an unofficial group. And it's like a secret spy network. I mean, Dan Brown would have a hate. I mean, just, you know, these fiction writers make up all this stuff. When you, actually, when you look at the history, there's, there's real weird things going on that, you know, are almost unbelievable, and yet they're true. And they would plant documents in professors' offices. They would steal material. They would do anonymous denouncements. It's like, you know, the Washington Post and the New York Times of the day in France. You know, the Washington Post wouldn't care when I was teaching in the classroom. You know, but imagine that they did. And you're saying, you know, Dr. Morrow, he's teaching that Moses didn't write the Pentateuch. You know, it's not what I teach. But anyway, but, you know, and then people get, then I would lose my job. That's what was happening is they were making anonymous denouncements in the newspaper, and the next thing you know, people would lose their job. So it was a really crazy time period. Pope Benedict talked about this because his teachers were the next generation. And so he actually witnessed with his own teachers some of the emotional, some of the challenges they went through. Actually, when Pope Benedict went for his second doctorate, it was called the Habilitation, it's Habilitation Schrift, his second doctorate on the theology of history in St. Bonaventure, he was required to remove a section of it because uh, Mikael Schmaus, the theologian on the, as a reader on his committee, said, now this is a modernist thing. You can't have that. That's not, that's not allowed. So he actually had to remove part of his thesis. Pope St. John the Twenty Third, right, was removed. He was not allowed to teach church history anymore because they thought he was using Loazie's church history teacher, Louis Duchesne's textbook in class. So he gets, he becomes a bishop, he, you know, Bulgaria, he gets appointed Pope John the Twenty Third. He goes into the Holy Office of the Inquisition, opens up his file, Angelo Roncalli, and it says, we suspect Angelo Roncalli is a modernist. The one piece of evidence they had was he had been sent a postcard from an old seminary buddy of his who was a suspected modernist. That was him. So he pulls his pen out, and he writes, I, John the Twenty Third Pope, declare I have never been a modernist. Okay? So this is just an important part of the history to keep in mind. There was an overreaction, a very popular overreaction, and there weren't, they weren't given the tools in a lot of ways to deal with this stuff. So I think that the, the time was right, in a sense, in the 60s and 70s, for this to come back and for scholars to unquestionably take what was, um, they weren't allowed to do, the methods they weren't allowed to do. They were primed to take this and just run with it as if this were the absolute truth. And the point, there's a point I would make. There's a great book by Father Eugene, Eugene Cavain. The, I think I mentioned this in the outline. It's called The Lord of History. It's not, not a well-known book. It's from the 1980s. It's a fantastic book. And he's got a supernatural vision to see the history. And he walks through Christian history, right? 20 centuries, focusing on this issue of a philosophy of history. But his section that deals with modernism 
is quite on point, and he gets better than most I've seen. He gets the connection between what's going on in the 19 teens, 1907, 1908, really 1890 to 1914, and then what's going on in the 1960s and 1970s. He understands 68 with Humane Vite, and Paul VI. He sees the connections. That's also the other book I mentioned, I think, in the first webinar. Unfortunately, it's only available in Spanish. I'm typing it out for you. Historia, some of you probably know Spanish. Historia Teológica del Modernismo. This was published in 1972 by Ramón García de Aro. Probably shouldn't say this, but I will. Uh, Ramón García de Aro. So I, I know a student, a former student of his. Ramon Garcia de Arro is an Opus Dei priest at the University of Navarra. Navarra published this book, which is an excellent book. I, I know a student, a former student of his, and he was told that Garcia de Arro was asked to work on this precisely because of the connections that were being seen between the fallout at the end of the 60s and early 70s and the modernist controversy. And the thought was if Garcia de Arro could get a handle on the roots the actual roots of the modernist controversy, it might be able to figure out what can be done now to help in the late 60s and early 70s, okay? Which in some ways was moot with the pontificates, right, of, of John Paul II, Benedict, and Francis because of the evangel the focus on evangelization changed everything. It was a game changer, right, with the new evangelization, which Paul VI already announced. A real game changer because we start, we start seeing Catholic evangelization boom in Africa and Asia and all these places where it wasn't doing so well it becomes amazing. Where now it's Asia and Africa and Latin America have the world's majority of Catholics and Christians in general, right? So, so some of this is somewhat moot, but it's still there in the academy. I experienced this in among scholars in the scholarly community. That's very important to keep in mind. So, how does this play out? So, what happens is two things. The Catholics are not allowed to engage in these methods. 1910, St. Pius X institutes the oath against modernism. If you're teaching at a Catholic seminary, if you're going to be ordained right to the priesthood as a deacon, if you are, you know, any of these official roles, you have to swear the oath against modernism annually. And this goes into the Second Vatican Council, right? And so you're going to, and what, what, what this, part of what this oath entails is you're going to hold to the teachings of Lamentabili, Hashendi, the early decisions of the Pontifical Biblical Commission. Paul VI changes the Pontifical Biblical Commission in the sense that prior to Pope Paul VI, the Pontifical Biblical Commission was a formal arm of the magisterium. It was part of the Pope's teaching office. You had to be a cardinal to be a member. It really was part of the magisterium. What Paul VI does, I think, in his wisdom, is he reconstitutes it. He sees the signs of the times. He says, this is dangerous terrain. He changes it. You no longer have to be a cardinal. And now it no longer has any authority. From 1972 onwards, the Pontifical Biblical Commission has no authority. It is simply an advisory committee to the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, right? So now it, it's scholars who advise the CDF, which does have magisterial authority, right? But they can do with what they want with the PBC. So that's an important part of the history. But it's, so, so the Catholic scholars are coming out, and what's happening? Nobody wants to play ball with them, right? They're scholars expected to do works of scholarship, and they're going to scholarly conventions which are primarily run by Protestants, and they're being told, you know, you don't, you're a Catholic. You can't do real scholarship. You've got a hold of these teachings of the Pope. you just got to say what the tradition says. How can you think for yourself? How can you engage in real scholarship? My response would be, read, gosh, read the biblical commentaries on St. Thomas Aquinas. If you don't think St. Thomas Aquinas can do real scholarship, he's doing real scholarship. Maybe, maybe he's not an expert in Hebrew or Greek, but he's reading the text of Scripture far more carefully than many of the scholars I know. Uh, I'm not going to name names, but I'm reading through Thomas's commentary on Job right now. He's reading the text in Latin incredibly carefully. 
I know a number of scholars that you know, work a little bit with the text, but they spend far more time reading the secondary literature, what other scholars are writing, than the actual text itself. And you can see this at these conferences. They'll know what Wellhausen said, or what some scholar who claims to be following Wellhausen have said. They don't even read Wellhausen anymore. They don't read the classics. They read the moderns, the contemporaries. It's, it's just too much literature. It's too difficult. And so Catholics were having this obstacle. They were being pushed out of all of the professional guilds. So what happens? A lot of things happen. They start to see signs of the times where they start to read what's coming from Rome and elsewhere as allowing them to engage in these methods. For good reason. The tone is changing already with Pope Saint, not Saint yet, sorry, Pope Pius XII, jumping the gun a little bit here, Pope Pius XII in 1943. In 1943, Pius XII decides to um, publish an encyclical in, in the anniversary, the 50th anniversary of Leo XIII's Providentissimus Deus. So he publishes Divino Flante Spiritu, which I'll write for you. It's not on the handout. There's a new problem he had to deal with in part, and that was people were over-spiritualizing things, and they didn't want to get back to history. They were neglecting the literal sense of Scripture, which is very important. It was very important for St. Thomas Aquinas. It's very important for the Church. It's very important if you want to understand the Bible. And so Pius XII starts to say, we need to engage in historical research, which Leo had already said we needed to do. And Pius XII starts to say, well, we can, you know, there's nothing wrong, right, with some, with engaging in some of these theories as theories. We always have to take the church's magisterium as the guiding principle, right? The church's magisterium is given the Holy Spirit to infallibly guide us to properly understand scripture. So keep that in mind. He, we can use the insights of the church fathers. And then understanding that, we can, we can engage in modern historical scholarship. We might be able to learn something from this. So then in 1964, the Pontifical Biblical Commission, still as a part of the magisterium, publishes Sancter, Sancta, sorry, Sancta Mater Ecclesia. Right, Holy Mother Church, on the historical truth of the Gospels, still part of the magisterium. In that document, it allows a form of form criticism. What is the basis there? The basis is this. The basic idea developing after Wellhausen, the form of criticism, is that there was an event. After the event, there was preaching about the event. After preaching about the event, there was writing about the preaching. This is a no-brainer, right? We can read this as, yeah, Jesus did something, and he said something. And the apostles preached his message. And then the apostles like Matthew and John and other disciples like Luke and Mark wrote this down, right? Now, the way in which that was being used, right, by the, by the more kind of liberal-leaning German source, I'm sorry, form critics, think of like Rudolf Bultmann, whose name I'm writing for you there, oops, sorry, Bultmann was two ends. Rudolf Bultmann is that there was some event, right, and then the preaching was loosely tied to the event, it was really an invention of the preacher more than anything else, adding in what they, the message they wanted communicated. And then some later writers, later communities wrote a message kind of loosely based on this preaching that they would then reinterpret. So that the text that you actually have is only loosely related to the actual events themselves. We translate that. The text of Scripture then, the Gospels, become loosely related to Jesus and what he actually said and did. Right, this is why you have groups like the Jesus Seminar from the 1980s and 90s trying to figure out, well, what did Jesus do? What do you think? Did he do this? You know, I'll catch this pebble. You know, what, is, what does the majority agree with? Well, he said very little that's actually in the scriptures, right? Um, and then the rest of it's later theological speculation. That is not what the Catholic Church is doing in Sancta Mater Ecclesia. 
which gets used by the Second Vatican Council at Dei Verbum in its dogmatic constitution on divine revelation, Dei Verbum, which cites Santa Mater Ecclesia, Divino Flante Spiritu, Providentismus Deus, and many of these other sources from the tradition, including St. Augustine and others, to help us understand what it's trying to teach. But that message, I don't think, has gotten across to the scholars at large, in my opinion. Um, and that's important to keep in mind. So I think you, you run into a lot, of, a lot of Catholic scholars that I run into, and this is part of the crisis, I think, that, that Ratzinger was dealing with, Pope Benedict was dealing with. What you see is they'll say, okay, so what, you know, if the Yoistic community wrote this or the Eloistic community wrote that, I still believe it's inspired by God, right? There's still this unified theological message from God. And that, that can be fine, that the individual scholars can come to faithful conclusions from these theories. My problem is, I think what the problem here is, is they are unaware often that the theories that they're using, number one, have real historical problems. There are real historical answers to the questions they pose, that they, the, the forgers of these theories, are not aware, were not aware of. And in some cases didn't care. They didn't care about that. They weren't doing that for that purpose. The second thing is that they are using methods that were originally forged by anti-Catholics with an anti-Catholic purpose, supporting the cultural content of Bismarck or whatever, right? But depending on what stage of the history we're talking about. And in some cases, they were anti-supernatural critics of Christianity. That's not Bellhausen's problem. That's not Michaelis's problem. That is Spinoza's problem. That was Toland's problem. Right? So that was the problem of some of these figures. And now they're using them, these scholars, some of them are priests, are using these theories as if they are neutral and objective. That's part of the problem. It's one thing to be using these and to say that, well, Genesis 15 was the early Yahwistic account of the covenant with Abraham, and Genesis 17 with circumcision is a later priestly account of the covenant with Abraham. And although they're contradictory accounts of the same covenant, God really made a covenant with Abraham, and we can learn something about that for our relationship. That's one thing. It's another thing to then see this as the way it was kind of forged as these things didn't happen. There was no Abraham. God did not make a covenant with Abraham. Personally, I find the work of, of more faithful scholars like Scott Hahn far more refreshing. And I'm thinking specifically of his, his book, Kinship by Covenant, right, which he published in 2009 from Yale University Press. Um, and it's a rewritten version of his doctoral dissertation. He has an account, again, a literary account based on ancient Near Eastern scholarship for why we have three accounts, Genesis 15, 17, and 22, of covenants with Abraham. They're not three contradictory accounts of the same covenant with Abraham. Rather, they are three accounts of three separate and successive covenants God made with Abraham. There's internal literary grounds, narrative grounds for reading these three covenants. God makes promises in Genesis 12. Makes three promises, right? Great nation, great, great name, blessing to all the nations. In Genesis 15, God is entering into a national covenant. Both parties are playing a role, Abraham and God. Abraham cuts animals in half. God passes through like a flaming pot. And what happens? The first promise through the land and the descendants of nationhood is there. Genesis 17, Abraham gets circumcised. What happens? He alone, as a treaty, he alone is participating in the covenant oath. The first two promises now are incorporated. Great nation, land and descendants, great name. Abram becomes Abraham. And then in Genesis 22, the binding of Isaac, God gives him the ultimate covenant where for the first time, he swears by himself to bless Abraham. And now for the first time in the context of a covenant, God reaffirms the three promises from Genesis 12. That explains right there very well in light of the historical scholarship we understand now of what 
ancient Near Eastern covenants look like, why there's three accounts. We don't need to go to Valhausen. We don't need to go to these other more skeptical views. We have a view that accounts for the material better. It has more explanatory power. Does that make sense? I think that's, that's kind of important when we're, we're thinking through the history of this, of this scholarship. I don't think most of these scholars in the universities, especially Catholic universities, I don't think they have bad intentions when they're teaching this material. I think in many cases they don't know the alternative. This is what they were taught, and it makes sense. You can isolate these texts, and they seem like different narratives. They don't question it. Right? They look at the Noah account, you know, the animals going into the ark. Right? There's two accounts. You know, God says, let the animals go in, and then you have the account of them going in. In one case, they're pairs, male and female. In the other, they're the clean and the unclean. Right? Whenever scholars bring this up to me, I, I know I have a systematician, a systematic theologian who studies this and teaches this in the inter, introductory scripture courses. He's not a Bible scholar. He says, but Jeff, it makes so much sense. You have two stories here. I said, first of all, <laughs> you have an account of God proclaiming it, and then you have the description of it being fulfilled. And then he says, but what about the clean and the unclean animals? And my response is always one of them, I don't know why scholars don't pay attention to this. I say, oh, yeah, tell me about that. Who did that? Which source is that? And he says, oh, it's obviously the priestly account, which makes sense, since the priestly account would be interested in issues of cleanliness and uncleanliness. Except nobody, to my knowledge, argues that's the priestly account. Bellhausen didn't argue that. Who argues it's the priestly account? It's the Yahwistic account, because it uses Yahweh for God, not Elohim. Elohim is used by the Elohist in the, in the, in the priestly account. And so I, I'm not aware of any scholar arguing. Maybe there's somebody out there. But the tradition is, no, the historical critical tradition is the account of the clean and unclean animals of Noah is the Yahwist account. Not the priestly account. Explain that. Where's the logic there? So, I mean, there's a lot of problems, even with the arguments themselves, when you're looking at these texts. It's very complicated stuff. And so to argue that this is, this is like uh, math, 2 plus 2 equals 4 math, is ludicrous. And to argue that it's neutral and objective can only be done when you ignore the entire history, which is shaped at every stage with philosophical and political motives. Does that make sense? And uh, Dr. Moore, you, you uh, have in your handout here something that's quite striking, uh, the influence of Jacob Grimm so on Dalhousen. Yes, could you that's talk more about that? The Guardian Angels, that's providential because I just realized I forgot Grimm. I'm st this is from, so Scott Hahn and Benjamin Weicker, when they were doing their politicizing the Bible, they drafted another document, a very large document no one has. But I got to see a copy of that early on, and I'm using it as I'm working on this stuff right, right now. And the most brilliant thing in there, in my mind, is this connection that Han and Weicker made that hasn't seen day. I'm going to make sure it sees the light of day, hopefully. It, between Jacob the Grimm. The, so the Grimm brothers we know from the fairy tales. But what a lot of you don't know is that Grimm was involved in writing a history of Germany. And what he did is, this is, again, a time period I mentioned, I think, in the last time, they're trying to retrieve German past, the mythic past and all that before Christianity. What Valhausen was a huge Grimm fan, what he did, and what it appears that he did, is that it appears that he took the scheme that Grimm used to describe the history of Germany with its kind of naturalistic religion and its pagan past prior to the priesthood of the, you know, Catholicism and then move towards a more liberating mo moment with Protestantism, he does that with the Old Testament. There was this kind of natural patriarchal religion. Then you get the corruption of the priesthood with ritual and circumcision and the temple and sacrifice, right? And then you get the religion of the prophets, Protestantism, if you will, kind of purifying it again and that sort of thing. And that's basically what he does. But I'm glad that you brought that up. That's pretty important and no one talks about it anywhere. Do you, um, a follow-up question, you just mentioned that, you know, the prophets or the, the religion of the Protestants. Is there a connection there with um, the, Protestant, the Protestant latch with Valhausen on the prophets and switch over to the New Testament with St. Paul as, not as opposed, but in, in distinction with the Gospels? Definitely. I mean, the, the move is, I mean, I think when you read the prophets, when you read Paul, right, they're very sacrificial, priesthood, sacraments, all of that stuff, cult, ritual, that sort of thing. Um, but the Protestant tradition has read uh, the prophets and 
Paul against all of that material. And Wellhausen completely, these scholars take that. They basically take the Protestant Reformation, run through the secular enlightenment. And this is what you come out with. Yeah, great. Uh, we have a question coming from Rachel, who asks, why is the Bible offered as just another piece of literature in many colleges? Uh, say that one more time. Why is the Bible offered as just another piece of literature in many colleges? That's a, that's a difficult, that's a difficult question to answer. I think it depends on the, on the colleges, but in general, I would say the way our universities are set up is, is, a, is one in which specific theological views are not given any kind of hearing, certainly not a main hearing. And so the idea is that it will be seen as a literature like any other, just as Christianity would be taught as a religion like any other. And this goes back at least to Machiavelli. Right? And so it's going to be read as a literary text. The one benefit I would say with that is when they, when they do that well and they don't, when they do like a, a literary reading and they don't get into the history, when they just do who's saying what, the plot, who are the main actors, sometimes you can actually get a pretty good sense of the text and the theology. Sometimes not. <laughs> Great. Um, let's see. Eileen asks... Uh, well, she asked, would you post a list of recommended books for us, which you, uh, Eileen, in the handout, the uh, outline, uh, Dr. Morrow has many references to great books to follow. But Dr. Morrow, would you recommend uh, maybe what are the top two books? And you can, you can put your own in there as well. Well, I would, but mine wouldn't be the top. I think the top I would put is uh, on this topic would be really Hahn and Weicker's Politicizing the Bible right now. There's plans, I believe, to do a popular version that's going to up that, I think, in the works in a few, in a few years. Um, but um, that's why I put as the number one on this history. It only goes to 1700. So wait till Scott and I finish this volume, and then you can get that one. And then the other one I would recommend really is The Lord of History. It's hard to get, but it's, it's the easiest to read of all of these. And it's, it's really fantastic. The Lord of History by Eugene Cavain, which I actually stumbled across because Dr. Hahn recommended it to me. So then I, I read it. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist. Pray for us.